So the anti-spyware, essentially, what we're looking to do with the anti-spyware is we're looking to stop any kind of malicious applications or anybody that's managed to make their way into the network from beaconing back out to their C2C servers. Um, it's essentially to stop, if you think about, if you think about antivirus as a way of stopping stuff coming into the network, anti-spyware is basically the way to uh, evaluate and protect against stuff leaving your network. And then vulnerability protection obviously is, is people running vulnerabilities, so you could argue that's kind of two-way. That isn't to say that any um, that any any rules that aren't outbound shouldn't have anti-spyware on them. Um, malicious traffic will try and find a way in and out as much as it possibly can, and you would be best placed to to have a look at the zones really and and the trust levels of your zones. I know the um, so the, the the phrase at the minute is zero trust and everything should be zero trust and that's absolutely true. But the journey to zero trust is a long one. Um, so what we need to do is we need to really start generating a model whereby we're evaluating all traffic and we're inspecting all traffic. So the anti-spyware profiles, I'll just get rid of this one just so that we can see it from the start. So the anti-spyware profiles are exactly the same as, as other ones. They come a default and a strict and the default as you can see has these options set for so if we look at how the default is constructed the um, the profile itself is constructed of signature policy, policies, signature exceptions, DNS policies, and DNS exceptions. Okay, the signature policies are essentially saying well, you got a policy name, you have a threat name, so you can match against the threat names, and we'll see them in a minute. We have the category here that you can drop down. Obviously, the default one that's on there is, is read only, as you can see. Uh, so we're looking for adware, autogen, botnet, browser hijack, DNSC2, DNS, DDNS, and so on. So we can we can um, customize this specifically to look for for actual categories of threats and actual categories of malicious activity, key loggers, and so on. And that's really to give you a really granular control over how those things are dealt with. So if by default you apply this policy then you would get these actions for these uh, these policy names so in this particular instance you wouldn't see anything for informational because there's no policy to cover it you would see everything from low to to critical signature exceptions so if you're going for signature exceptions um, and we do a show all signatures we can see that we've now got all the signatures and there's 8516 uh, within the within the database at the minute, the threat name is here. So if you were to use this threat name um, within your signature policies here, threat name there, then that would um, that would match that threat name. Okay. So with the signature exceptions, we can create exceptions within here. Um, if we wanted to, we can create a. And uh, we can't do it in here, obviously, because this is read only. But we could create an exception. Um, we can also check as well, and here's an interesting thing, so we can also check, uh, we can go for find matching signatures. So if we pick a, a policy here, say simple medium, find matching signatures, um, initially the first thing you notice is that there are no signatures, but there has to be signatures, right? And at some point, there's been a disconnect in the back-end code that has basically meant that when you click that button there, the Find Matching Signatures, as you can see, the filter that it creates is rule equals simple medium. But that isn't how it is. Um, that's not how it's presented here. It's presented as policy. So if we just change that to policy, and now we can see all the threats that will be covered under the under the policy. So again, if we wanted to if we wanted to bin that and go for informational. So now we've got informational here. So we have things like suspicious TLS evasion and so on. And that's allow, and there's no packet capture for it. So moving on then, we've got DNS policies. DNS policies, by default, with the uh, the threat subscription, you get the default Palo Alto DNS. 
So this is going to give you your uh, DNS signatures from the Palo Alto Network's content download. And then you've got your policy action and your uh, packet capture settings there, or and a log severity for when one of these is triggered. If you have the DNS security subscription, then that's when these start being evaluated. And again, you have the same, uh, you have the log severity, just if I could. So you have the log severity, so what it's gonna be um, logged as, and the, the policy action, and the packet capture as well, the packet capture settings. DNS exceptions are the DNS, um, you know, if, if you're having stuff that's firing and you and you know for a fact it's trusted or, or um, you know, it's for something that's been tested or something like that, then you'd put your exceptions in here and then that would be an allow list for DNS domain FQDN as it says there. And then you have DNS signature exceptions. So if there's a signature, specifically a threat ID that you want to Except exempt from um, from any kind of anti-spyware profile, then you would add that in there. So whilst in most situations, I think you'd want to go for the strict um, the strict profile, strict anti-spyware profile. There is an inherent issue with using the built-in ones, and that is because essentially with the default one, you'll find that you'll still hit false positives that are going to need to have exceptions put against them, and the problem with these ones is, of course, that they are read-only. So to get around the read-only problem is we see a read-only. So if we try and adjust anything, we can't add. We can't put signature exceptions in. Um, we can't put DNS policies in. We can't put DNS exceptions in because there is no add. Okay, so I would then clone the strict one. Once that's cloned, we can rename it. So we're going to call it our custom strict policy. And now we can change the we can change the, the signatures and we can change the exceptions and change the way they work. So if we wanted, for instance, within our simple critical, if we wanted to, and as I would suggest is best practice, have a packet capture, an extended capture, because these are critical. Um, severities, these are the, the worst ones. Any threat name means it's going to match any threat name, any category means it's going to match any category. And now we have an extended capture for that. Um, we can create this as a single packet capture. It's still going to reset both. I'm going to take a packet capture. And then for medium, we have reset both and disable. For low, um, you could leave the, the action as default or you could change the action if you wanted to, sorry, change the action if you wanted to, to reset client or, or drop. Bear in mind that default means that it's going to use the default action of that signature. So if we again go matching, find matching signatures, of course it's not going to find anything because of the whole policy issue. So we just change that. So simple and low. So the default action is in the brackets obviously at the side. But our rule says that our simple low policy is going to use that that alert action. If we wanted to change that, so if in our we wanted to have any low um, any low severity things uh, signatures being triggered, we wanted to change the action. We wanted to drop it. We drop it there, and then now that means that all our simple low, that's part of our policy, all our simple low is now going to be dropped. In the same way that if we now, so if we come back to here and we just put that back to default. In the same way, if we wanted to, if we had a, an issue specifically, let's say with with this, so we'll go with hot offers because I've just literally copied the, the text so that I can add this in. Uh, the threat ID for that is 10218. Okay, so if we had an issue with this hot offers adware and we specifically wanted to um, to block that uh, or Z toolbar, but we go with hot offers because say the copy and paste thing, um, we can create a separate rule for that. These rules are evaluated top down, which is why we have the move up, move down. So we would create our hot offers 
drop rule. And then in here, we can paste our hot offers threat name. Any category, we know for a fact that is adware. And for what we want to do is we want to drop it and we want to capture a single packet so that we can capture the uh, we can capture the, the the user that was going to it. So we put that in there. Now, of course, we want this to be evaluated first, so we'd move it up. Not that one. So move it up. So now our hot offers is going to be dropped after medium. That's how it's going to be evaluated. So that's how we create a um, that's how we create a, a specific uh, signature. We can also do fine matching signatures, and we can change that to policy. And then we've got our hot offers. So we know that is now going to uh, we've changed the default action because our policy is going to do something else. DNS policies, as we said before, we can then change these as well. So these are all part of our DNS subscription and we have the default informational. We can actually change the severity here as well. So the log severity can be changed based on um, uh, what we deem it to be. So if we have specifically um, command and control domains, I mean, that's set as high. So you would be tempted to leave that where it was. Default action is to block. We can allow. Allow in this case means we still get a log. A log entry is still created. There is no alert. Where there is no alert, that generally means that you get a, a log uh, created anyway. Or we can block it or we can sinkhole it. Sinkholing is uh, defined here. So we've got our DNS sinkhole settings. We can change these. These are provided by, you've got the Palo Alto Network sinkhole, sinkholepaloaltonetworks.com. So if you find there's traffic going to sinkhole.paloaltonetworks.com, then you you you've identified basically a, um, a, a host that's that's got malicious activity on it. You can customize this, and create it, create your own. So you create a loopback or something that means that the uh, the host has to tram tram. Bleh traverse the firewall in order to get to that IP address and then you get the logs and then you can create reports and this is how you start to build up a picture of malicious activity on your network and then we have the sinkhole for the IPv6 as well but where we go to sinkhole traffic sinkhole is used specifically so that it just gets sinkhole the, the, the client because obviously some of these clients are very clever the client has no idea what's happening it's just beaking in and out and as far as it's concerned it's getting no reply at all and then we have the packet capture, uh, single packet and extended capture again for those signatures that are contained within the DNS security subscription, which also covers uh, online machine learning and um, is, is sort of very, very quick to be able to react. The DNS exceptions, as we said before, this is where we then put our DNS exceptions. So now we've got our custom strict policy and we can use our custom strict policy either within a profile group and then add the profile group to a rule or we can just use it as part of the, the profiles. Um, so that's anti-spyware. Uh, just to reiterate, remember again, that, um, the antivirus is really looking for viruses, worms, trojans, and so on, that are being brought into your network through um, malicious files, uh, FTP traffic, SMB traffic, and so on. It can decode those, and it can look for those signatures within that. And then anti-spyware is things beating out it's it's uh, malicious hosts and malicious applications trying to get back to its um its command and control server